I can describe early 20th century immigration. E as a prefix at the beginning of a word means out. Migra means move. So emigrate means to move out. Immigrate, M means in, so it means to move in. Emigrate, why do people move out of the country? Because of push factors. Why? Few jobs, natural disasters. I can't grow crops, I can't grow food because of the weather. But the biggest reason is going to be war. You go throughout human history and the reason why people move is because, hey, you know, there's bombs dropping next to me. I don't want to die today. I'm going to go to another country. And that country that most people immigrate to that's pulling them in is the United States of America. Very few wars here. There will not be a bomb dropped on your head today or tomorrow. It's safe. There are plenty of services, whereas in your other country, there may not be police protecting you and your rights. There may not be hospitals. There might not be schools, but in America, we have that. In America, we have jobs. So emigrate, moving out, being pushed out. These countries and locations changed throughout American history. But immigrate, it's pretty much always the same destination. Everybody's coming to America. Here is a map showing the immigration from 1840 to 1920. You can see a lot of people moving out of Europe to the United States. You might say, oh, that's crazy. Why are people leaving Europe? Well, the same reason that they're moving to America, you just do the opposite. So they're moving to America then. Same reason they're moving to America today. Jobs, opportunity, rights, and stable government. So why did you leave Europe? Because during that time period, there were not jobs, there were not opportunities, their rights were not protected, and the governments were not stable. Today, today, Europe, there are jobs and opportunities, the rights, and there's a stable government. So you don't see immigration into America. We are seeing that, though, from Latin America because they don't have jobs, opportunities, their rights are not being protected, and they're corrupt governments. Immigrants in the 1800s. So we look at the people who first came to America, or at least not the first came, but the people that immigrated in the 1800s were mainly from Ireland and England and Germany. They spoke English. They were Protestant. So for the most part, they were accepted. They still faced discrimination. The Irish and the Germans faced discrimination. That's always going to be the case. If you're the new kid in town, if you move into a new place, the people that were already there aren't always going to completely accept you. But... If you are similar to them, the more that you are like them, the easier it is for you to start to fit in. And being that the Irish and the English spoke English, they were all Protestant, it's easier for them to fit in in America. We look at the Eastern Europeans that move into the country. They do not speak English. That's going to make it hard to fit in. They're Catholic and Jewish. They don't have the same views and beliefs. That's going to make it harder to fit in. And not even that. It's just if you are different, people treat you different. You're going to face racism. So not only are they discriminated against, they're just simply not accepted. And in a lot of cases, these Eastern European immigrants have to create their own ethnic communities where they are completely separate from Americans. So we see the Western Europeans, English, and they have pretty similar views to the people that were already in America. It's easier for them to fit in. Just like if you're the new kid and you move to a new town and everybody's already kind of like you, sure, it's going to be rough for a couple of days, but eventually you get to hang it. And that was kind of uh, the analogy here with Western Europe. But Eastern Europe, darker skin, speak a different language, different beliefs. If I move into a new community and I don't speak the language, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to get a job. It's going to be hard for my kids to go to school. If I have different beliefs and religious views, it's going to be hard to get along with the people that are already there. Even the people that aren't racist, it's going to be hard for us to figure things out and to get along. And I'm going to face discrimination. I may not be able to get a job. I may not be able to get a home. Ellis Island is a famous a uh, checkpoint for immigrants into the country where they had the health check and their backgrounds checked. It is a historical place you can visit today. A lot of the records have been preserved so you can find out where your ancestors came from. The nativists, Americans that opposed allowing immigrants into the U.S. that were not Western European. Racist, yes, but not just completely racist. There was also an element of economic security here. Yes, I'm not going to downplay the racism. They said, hey, you look different. We don't like you. Sure, that's definitely a part of the nativist belief. But also, there is some economic theory here or just fact that if immigrants come into the country, there's more people competing for jobs. That may result in the natives losing their job or their wages going down. So the Chinese will be who we talk about here. The Chinese Exclusion Act bans Chinese immigrants. Why? Yes, racism is a part of it. But also, when you increase the supply of something, the price goes down. 
So that applies to goods and it's easy for us to understand. So if the supply of gold is rare or low, we know that the price is really high. And if the supply of something is really high, then we know the price is really low. That's simple. That also applies to labor or services that you provide. If you are a doctor and you work on brains, you're a brain surgeon. There's very few people that can do that. Your services are rare. People are going to have to pay you more for that service. They can't say, oh, I don't want to pay $1.5 million. I'm just going to go to, oh, yeah, there's no one else that can operate on me. I guess I have to pay your price. That's how that works, as opposed to flipping cheeseburgers. A lot of people can flip cheeseburgers. And if I'm looking for people to flip cheeseburgers at my store, I can ask you and you say, oh, five bucks. All right, well, guess what? I'm going to go ask the other 300,000 people in this country and I'll find the person who's willing to work for the least amount possible because anyone could flip a cheeseburger, so I'm going to pay the person the least. So here's how bidding war works, 10, 7, 8, uh, in a free market, this guy gets the job, assuming that they all have the same skill level. If we lower the supply, the price will go up. Now you're going to say, oh, well, you just conveniently, da, 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 da. All right, think of it this way. Here's America. These are the nativists. There's these people competing for jobs. Now, all of a sudden, you have an influx of Chinese immigrants. You have increased the supply, which lowers the price. Play this out in your head. I am going to hire one worker. Who wants it? $10, $7, $8. Anyone else? Anyone else want to make a bid? We've increased the supply. There is more of a chance. It's more likely that someone is going to work for a lower wage. Six. Five, four dollars. I'll work for four dollars. That did not happen before when you had a lower supply. When we had a lower supply, the price, the labor, wages were higher. When we increase the supply, we have more people bidding. We have made the services less scarce. We've made the services that they're providing less rare. And so we have lowered the price. And the nativists will see this and they'll lose jobs and their wages are going to go down. They're going to blame the Chinese and they'll pass a law that kicks the Chinese out of the country and, and prevents them from moving in. And that's part of the racist element. Ultimately, what they need to do is try to develop more skills. And as you develop more skills, your services will become more rare. The supply of people providing your specific skill will decrease and that will drive your wages up. It's a way to separate instead of just, nah, just kick them out. Probably not the answer. So yes, racism is involved, but also money is absolutely involved. So we've covered the nativists. Racism is a part of it, but there's also economic factors at play. And then the Chinese Exclusion Act is a perfect example. Yes, the Chinese were excluded from this country for racist purposes, but also for economic purposes. Less people competing for jobs raises wages up, like doctors and lawyers. Very few people get into the professions because of all the restrictions and requirements. And when there's very few that can provide it, that then causes the price to be really high because you have to pay their price. But if there's a bunch of people that can build a house, then we're going to hire the people that are willing to work for the least amount of money. Japan wins the war with the uh, Russians and they start thinking they're big and bad. And you know what? They do deserve some credit. Maybe they are a world power, but America isn't hearing it. Dude, you got lucky. We're going to stay racist. We're not going to treat you as equals. So remember, supply goes up, price goes down. So the same thing that applied to the Chinese moving to the country, driving wages down, the same thing you could apply today with Latin Americans moving into the country and you have a high supply of specific workers that drives the wages down for that specific task. Now, if you're in a, it doesn't affect everybody. Obviously, Latin American immigrants aren't doctors, so we aren't increasing the supply of doctors, so they're protected. But construction workers kind of affects them a little bit. So economic opposition often leads to this racial opposition Anyway, supply up, price down. More immigrants drives wages down. So the Chinese were driving wages down. The Japanese moving to the country are going to drive wages down. Now I need to move my picture here because it's in the way. But all right, so here we go. So the Japanese are going to move into the country. They're going to move to San Francisco and they will immigrate in. Uh, the U.S. workers, not wanting to compete, not wanting their wages to go down, are going to try to exclude the Japanese. And they're also going to make the Japanese go to separate schools. And the Japanese are going to be offended by this. How dare you disrespect us? Don't you know we just beat Russia 1v1? And of course we do, but we don't really care. And so the president, there he is again, jumps in the middle and says, ah, I'll go work this out. I fix everything. I solve all the problems. That's what I do. 
what I do. So he will come up with a plan, and his plan is going to be called the Gentleman's Agreement. And so what he says is, look, I know, Japan, you feel disrespected. Here's what we're going to do. Your, your children are no longer going to be segregated. They're not going to be forced into separate schools. But you got to do us a favor. You got to stop coming to our country. So it's kind of a one for one. Stay out. Kind of like the Chinese Exclusion Act. But because we want you to save face and we know that you will be disrespected because you did you know, beat Russia 1v1. So we'll give you a little bit and we're going to treat your Japanese children with the same rights as American children. Cool. Great. It's called the Gentleman's Agreement. Awesome. Done. Kind of racist still. Whatever. All right, so we have covered the nativist racist, but also some economic factors at play for immigration, the Chinese Exclusion Act, and what happens to the Japanese immigrants. And this has really been pretty much the story for every immigrant to the country, the Irish, the Germans, the Italians, the Jews from Eastern Europe, um, the, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Latin Americans today. The rules don't change. The story stays the same. Yes, racism is always going to be a part of the story, but also economic factors are always going to be a part of the story, and it never changes. The only thing that changes, not America, we're always going to be the magnet. The only thing that changes is where people come from. That's the only thing, the only part of the story that is different. So when people are flipping out about immigration today, it's the same 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and it will be the same in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years and 40 years. It's, it's not going to change, folks. It is simply not going to change. What else we got in here? So assimilation, you might remember this from an earlier video. We remember uh, forcing the American men, Indians, or the First Nations people here to assimilate and westernize. Same thing happens to the Germans. You can see Germans changing their names, changing the names of things. All of this was an example of you got to become like us. You want to come fit in? You want to come be a part of this country? Then you're going to have to change what you are. And there's a perfect example. You can change from the wiener dog to a different dog, uh, delicatessen to English delicacies. You know, they just change, whatever. Uh, another irony of the nativists. So the nativists oppose immigrants coming to the country because A, they're racist, and B, because of economic factors. But the reality or the irony here is that the nativists were once immigrants themselves, and if they weren't, then their ancestors were once immigrants that faced the same opposition. The nativists today in this country who may face uh, or may oppose immigration from Latin America, and even if they're not racist, even if they're not racist and they're simply protesting immigration for economic purposes, their ancestors faced the exact same thing. So you can see in this cartoon, these rich men, they were once immigrants as well, or at least their ancestors were once immigrants as well. Emigrate, immigrate, push factors, push factors, push factors, pull factors. Here's another interesting thing that we look at here. So take note of the number. If you look at this map, so we're looking at immigration, pull factors into the country, and we see over 30% were born somewhere else, 20%, 30%. And then we see in the South, why there's no immigration into the South whatsoever. When well, you look at the time period, 1820 to 1920, it's all about jobs. Why didn't anyone immigrate into the South during this time period? We talked about how America is this magnet pulling people in. We've got all this good stuff. Well, there's one thing that the South did not have at that time. There's one thing that the South did not have to attract immigrants, and it was job opportunities. Why weren't there job opportunities in the South from 1820 to 1920? Why couldn't you get a job? Well, you could get a job, but you just had to be willing to work for nothing because there was slavery. So people did not move into the South because the job did not exist. The jobs were already filled by people who were being forced to work for free. So that's why people moved elsewhere. That's what explains this immigration pattern. You can look at the pull factor, better job opportunity didn't exist. And still, even after slavery, because you could say, well, 1865 is when the Civil War ended, even up to 1920, we still do not have people moving into the South. Well, the reason for that was because the economy of the South was based on slavery and farming and agricultural based, they did not have factories. And so even once slavery ended, the factories were in the other parts of the country. So if you move to a place, that place needed to have factories. That place needed to be industrialized. They needed to have manufacturing jobs for you. Those did not exist here. So even after slavery ended, there weren't jobs. There weren't factories for you to move into in the South. 
So you should be able to describe a lot of 20th century immigration. And if you can describe 20th century immigration, then you can describe 21st century immigration and you'll be able to describe 22nd century immigration, although you'll be dead by the time the 22nd century, well, yeah, you'll be dead. Sorry. Sorry to break the news on that one. Well, it depends. If you're like five and watching this video, then maybe you'll be alive. Well, we could always reach the singularity, but we'll save that for another video.